Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. There is outrage after CBC reported on allegations that more than a dozen people bought affordable housing condos when they didn't actually qualify. Some even owned multiple properties. What's your reaction to this story and these allegations? And what oversight do you think is needed? After 12.30, yet another local council mired in public divisiveness, this time the village of Sayward. How are municipal politicians doing? Has their job become harder than ever? Our Justin McElroy will join us. I'm Michelle Elliott. Welcome to BC Today. Thank you for joining us on CBC Radio 1, CBC Television, and live streaming on the CBC News app, cbc.ca slash bc, and on the CBC Vancouver YouTube page. Well, this week, CBC reporter Jason Proctor broke the story of civil suits launched by BC Housing against 13 people. Now, BC Housing accuses them of lying to be able to obtain condos that were priced below market as part of its affordable home ownership program. Victoria's vivid condo development was subsidized by the province and hailed at the time as a new model for affordable housing. The stipulations to be able to get in included a household income limit of $150,000 and a requirement not to own any other property. But the suit alleges a number of them already owned multiple homes worth millions. Now, the allegations haven't been proven in court. The developer wouldn't comment to CBC while the case is before the court. Here is CBC's Jason Proctor with more. So this story kind of centers around a 135-unit condo building in downtown Victoria that was kind of a pilot project for the BC government's plans to tackle the affordability housing crisis in BC. The deal was this. The government provides a low-interest loan to a developer. The developer then passes those savings along to middle-income families by allowing them to buy condos at below-market prices if they meet certain criteria. Now, according to the plan, those criteria have to be that you can't own property anywhere else in the world, you have to have an income of below $150,000 combined for everybody in the household, and you have to agree to live in the condo, and in this case, it's a place called The Vivid in Victoria, for a period of two years. You cannot rent it out, but, we found about 13 lawsuits that BC Housing has uh, launched against people who bought as part of this project that says, well, something very different was happening in at least a dozen of these cases. So what they say is that none of these people ended up living in their suites. And in fact, you know, some of them were accused of renting them out. Some of them were also allegedly bought by people who owned multiple other properties. Uh, in one case, uh, a couple who owned six other houses, detached houses in the Victoria area worth $7.75 million. Now, BC Housing is also suing a real estate agent who represented a bunch of these people in their purchases of these places. Uh, they're trying to get back the $53,000 in commission uh, that she earned through those sales. She's responded to the lawsuit. She denies those claims and she says in part uh, any problems she had in terms of doing this was through her limited uh, understanding of English. Not many of the other claims have been responded to, but there is one claim in which a woman says, well, she didn't in fact get uh, you know anything other than fair market uh, price for the condo that she bought. And in fact, she says if anybody has uh, benefited from this whole scheme, it's the government of BC who published their involvement in it. Jason Proctor, CBC News, Vancouver. Housing Minister Ravi Kalan has responded to this story. This morning on the early edition, he told host Stephen Quinn he found it infuriating. Can you imagine the way people who are trying to get into the housing market, who have scrimped and saved everything to try to get a foothold in being able to purchase a property, how they feel knowing that people who own multiple residential units already or millions of dollars worth of real estate somehow managed to buy a below market cost condominium intended for first time buyers? Well, you bet. It's infuriating. People uh, would be pissed off, and they should be pissed off, and, and I'm pissed off, uh, you know, the fact that this could happen in this building. Uh, but I think it's important to note we are going after these individuals with everything we have, and uh, this is not something we see in any other buildings because of the changes in 2018 to uh, all of the programming uh, requiring a higher, higher level of due diligence. 
And what has the follow-up been with the developer? Uh, well, you know, the developer has been uh, very good uh, at this. Uh, since the uh, revelations came to light, they brought in a third party uh, to give them advice on how to ensure that uh, it is uh, principal residence requirements, uh, that all the things are being followed. And so they have, since the uh, the initial cases come forward, been very helpful to ensure that uh, we're able to identify everyone that is, uh, you know, breaking the rules and uh, and bought these units inappropriately. Meanwhile, BC United housing critic Peter Millibar points blame at the provincial government. Our concerns are, are a couple. Uh, first off, uh, we raised concerns around the housing hub project going on in Merritt at the time. Uh, the, the then minister, now premier, brushed off those concerns and apparently didn't bother doing any additional oversights as we move into the Victoria project. So despite uh, the government's efforts to try to paint this as a former BC Liberal project, uh, it very clearly uh, lines up with statements and announcements made by the premier while he was the housing minister around this project. Uh, the fact that there was uh, such little oversight and, and double checking of people's applications uh, is shocking, especially when you consider Housing Hub was cited in the EY report around having uh, major issues within that program. And then moving forward, seeing Housing Hub basically being renamed as BC Builds with additional dollars being added into it without any assurances that any of these types of structural problems within the program itself have been properly addressed. And so uh, I think the Premier has a lot to answer for uh, moving forward. Well, we're asking what are your reactions to these allegations of abuse of an affordable housing program? And what due diligence do you think is needed to ensure that people who access affordable housing programs actually qualify? You can call us 1-800-825-5950, 604-669-3733. You can also uh, hit pound 690 on your cell phone. By email, we're at bctoday at cbc.ca. And joining me now to talk about this and take your calls is Andy Yan. He's director of the City Program at Simon Fraser University. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Andy. Thanks so much for being here. Always a pleasure. What went through your mind when you heard this story? Well, actually, I think what, what went through in my mind initially is actually how this is an example of how the system actually works. Mm. And I think the first thing I'd like to begin is actually this is the importance of local journalism, of how someone like the CBC will bring out these stories of how what's happening with the system and how the system, I think, is finding a level of accountability. Now, this being said, I think this is really a clear example where there's a fundamental need for both income and asset verification when it comes to these programs that I think that when we went through this particular program, it caught these particular individuals who don't qualify for this project and I think are, as a consequence, now seeking remediation through the courts. It seems to be retroactive, though. Should that verification not happen at the outset? I think that that's part of it. I think that it should happen in the outset. I think that there is a very clear kind of process that they need to modify. One has to remember that this is a pilot program. And as a pilot program, we've now discovered maybe that landing needs a bit of work. And I think that as such, then I think certainly when it comes to both income and asset verification, it will have to be done in a much more rigorous, a much more transparent and accountable way. Let me ask you, you know, the question that Stephen asked uh, the housing minister, Ravi Callan, how do you think people are feeling, people who have scrimped and saved um, to be able to afford a home, um, finally find a program that uh, through which they may be able to enter into the market, uh, hearing these kinds of stories, uh, given that we are in this housing crisis? Well, quoting the minister of housing for the province of British Columbia, pissed off. How closely, I was going to say, how closely do you want to quote him? There I you go. I think that a very citation, a direct citation to the minister. <laughs> of, the minister, I think, really, I think, captures the collective frustration at individuals who are taking advantage of the system. A, I think, clear collective action towards the development of affordable housing, in this case, a very specific form of affordable home ownership for a particular population that I think we are all I think, uh, pursuing that I think that this is one response towards the profound housing challenges that are occurring not only in just one city in British Columbia, but in many, many communities. And I think that this is as such, I think, a, a, a response. And then I think pursuing the kind of, I think, um, uh, legal consequences that are happening right now. 
We're taking your calls on this. What do you make? Uh, what is your reaction to allegations of uh, abuse of an affordable housing program in BC? And what oversight, what due diligence do you think is needed to ensure that people who access affordable housing programs actually qualify? Again, BC Housing has sued 13 people, accusing them of lying in order to obtain below market price condos in Victoria. And these allegations are now in front of the court and have not been proven yet. Uh, we want to hear from you and your reaction. Uh, right now, Steve is joining us in Squamish. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Thanks so much um, for calling in. What are your thoughts? Well, I find it kind of laughable, actually, because I'm not surprised at all with what happened. The government has to realize that all developers are in development for profit. They don't care where the profit comes from. So this type of thing is going on in all communities, which was just mentioned before I got on the call, and will continue to do so unless the government has adequate oversight. So now we're trying to go after the people that got in the back door, so to speak. But um, the developer is not going to care who buys the units and how they're priced and such terms of um, as market housing and such that get thrown out all the time. It's a bit of a, again, a, a, it's a non-term because things sell for whatever the market will bear. Mm. And developers go into every community around BC. It's happened lately in our community. They come up from Vancouver mm. and they build all these buildings and they pretend that they care about the community. I hate to be so blunt, but what they care about is profit. If not the developers, though, I mean, you know, when Squamish housing is tight, um, yeah. who can the province turn to? Well, that's the thing. You, you have to get together with the planners and the people. And I'm not saying that the developers shouldn't be building them because, of course, the government doesn't build housing. But you must have proper checks and balances in place to ensure that, um, that they're not uh, selling the units to uh, just anybody. And that's what's really happened here. And the realtor who did it, who's claiming that she wasn't aware of what was going on, is again, the realtors only care about how much money they make on the sale and purchase of homes. They don't okay. care where the money comes from. Okay. That's the bottom line. Steve, thank you so much. Good to hear from you in Squamish as well, where we know uh, the housing crunch really has uh, affected the community there. What about the, the role of developers here? Well, I think that it's it's important to understand the kind of strengths and the kind of, I think, expertise that developers can, I think, bring in. But then, of course, I think it's really being clear with what the expectations are in that type of relationship. I think really becoming, I think, very clear performance measures, very clear monitoring measures that are going to need to occur as you build up these partnerships. That with any partnership, I think it's having very clear ground rules. Uh, let's take a call now from Daniel in Delta. Hi, Daniel. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Thanks for calling in. Uh, thank you for taking the comment. Uh, I have a, you know, I moved to British Columbia about 12 years ago, and I can't help thinking that I've heard the same story before. You know, when the media discovers what I would call corruption within the system, people abusing the system. And these people, from what I'm seeing on the newscast in the last two days, these folks that have been caught claiming they didn't understand English in terms of the process, and, and others who have great deals of assets being able to take advantage of these programs. We hear these newscasts, the, the government claiming they're going to go after these people, and then it seems like it just peters out. And there's, there, I hope the government does go after these people who have been caught so-called red-handed and, and form some sort, of, uh, some sort of precedence for others not to abuse the system when they have an opportunity because these people clearly had opportunities and they took advantage of the system including all the realtors who are supposed mm. to be professional. Daniel, thank you so much. And what uh, we've heard is that BC Housing is, is, has launched these suits uh, as a means of a deterrent. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the call. Uh, Scott writes as, as well an email. This is an example, another example of property and land speculation. Mm -hmm. BC, BC should have a citizen, citizen dividend, dividend, rather, pardon me, funded by a 1% land tax to discourage land hoarding. This would provide $1,600 per month to every family of four and end hunger in BC. So looking at uh, that as a source of uh, 
um, added income for uh, families who need help. Uh, Richard points out, we all file our speculation tax exemptions and income taxes, so the government has all the data they need to verify applicants' property ownerships and incomes. And that uh, kind of goes to what Peter, Mil Peter Millibar was saying, is that this is due diligence, um, mm -hmm. that, that the data is there. Um, given that... Uh, We've now embarked on the, you know, the BC Builds program, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, affordable housing programs. What are, as, as our caller just said, what are the lessons to be learned then moving forward? Well, I think <clears throat> certainly in the case of legal cases, I think that um, BC, uh, BC Housing is also pursuing uh, uh, punitive damages. That I think that that's certainly one. But I think what would be interesting is that if they pursue criminal charges, the fact that they've essentially, it seems that you have 10% of these purchasers lying on their applications, that actually is, it's, 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 it's being deceptive in terms of a statutory declaration. And I think that this is actually something that I think an earlier story had covered is that when you do that, that's actually a criminal charge. And so one hopes that that is something that would be pursued. But I think it also highlights, I think, really some of these larger problems. You remember that when it comes to newly built condos in the city of, of Victoria, 64% are actually investor owned. So it actually mm. is actually touching upon really a larger problem that's not only in the city of Victoria, but all can be found throughout British Columbia and really the need for policy and really mechanisms in terms of dealing with this. Jason Proctor did reach out to Ron Usher, who's general counsel for the Society of Notaries Public of BC, this may be what you heard, mm -hmm. who said lying on a statutory declaration like the kind needed to buy a condo at this, uh, this condo development is a crime. Frankly, it might be time for some criminal prosecutions, Usher told the CBC. And he said it's one thing to have all these laws which are made in good intent for the public good. The public needs to have confidence that the laws are enforced. Mm -hmm. And when there's really obvious breaches of those laws, people would like to see confidences flow and that is this is a particularly egregious one so that quote coming from ron usher who's general counsel for the society of notaries public of bc right now it is bc housing that's launched these suits against 13 people uh, these are in, before the court right now uh, and uh, no allegations have been proven in court i uh, just want to say that in, uh, as well um, janet is our next caller we'll go to her uh, in just a few minutes this is bc today taking your calls on this of course 1-800-825-5950 Zero six zero four six six nine three seven three three twelve twenty three now one twenty three in the Mountain Time Zone. You're with BC today. And more on this story, yes, a more than a dozen people allegedly abused affordable housing program, uh, a program to purchase vivid condos. There were people living there who were eligible. We spoke with Brady Quaid, who lives in the building. Look at that opportunity. I was really thankful. And there was no part of me that was looking to game the system uh, with that sort of opportunity. Um, it's unfortunate that, you know, there were people that took it as that. Um, and I'm glad to see that they're being held accountable. It was interesting to see uh, some people uh, moving out after hours without uh, elevator <laughs> reservations. Um, and just, you know, uh, not being really on the up and up. And so the, it happened to one person that was on my floor. Um, it was interesting timing. It was sort of around the time that I came to learn that BC Housing was taking action against people. Uh, so you're able to put two and two together at that point. Um, there was definitely a sense of disappointment that people um, put BC Housing in that position. I think that it was um, on their behalf and the developer really trying to do the right thing and do something good for the community that others were able to well, try to take advantage of and thankfully have been proven otherwise. That was Brady Quaid. He owns a condo in Victoria's Vivid Building. We are taking your calls on this today as well and asking you, what is your reaction to allegations that 13 people lie to obtain below market price condos at an affordable price, uh, affordable housing project in Victoria? What oversight is needed? This is BC Today. Our next caller now is Janet in Alder Grove. Hi, Janet. What's your reaction? Oh, hi there. Um, so disappointed. I'm sure that everybody else is as well. But I, I have a question. And how clear was it that there were 
parameters around applying for one of these um, below market housing units. We, you know, was it clear to the applicants the um, household income limitation and the first time home buyers? Because if it was, and obviously this has already been talked about, but that's those individuals' responsibility, and that's basically fraud, and they should be held accountable. And so how clear was it, uh, is your question. And so um, uh, you're, you're saying that uh, that would be a consequence of this, but your, your question is when a project like this is undertaken, how clear is it what the stipulations are? Yes. Okay. Janet, thanks so much for the call. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes. Andy Yan is with me, director of the city program at SFU. What I can say is that, you know, from our reporting at the time, um, uh, David E.B. Hale, the 2021 20, completion, he was uh, of this construction. He was housing minister at the time as great news for middle income British Columbians. Um, it was uh, seen as a kind of forebearer of other mm -hmm. affordable housing programs. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, when it comes to that, I guess the question is then who, you know, what is the onus on, on a potential buyer to ensure that they're abiding by the laws, I think is what Jan Janet's question. I think tremendous that you're talking about the biggest purchase in the lives of most households in British Columbia. One might think that there's a level of due diligence in terms of that massive sizable pro uh, purchase. And I think that it's also, I think, on the level of government to ensure that when it comes to these programs, they are accountable, that there is a monitoring system in terms of ensuring that they go to the population that you're trying to house. I think that this is really, I think, in one way, in its own way, a good news story because it's how the system worked. And then at the same time, it's also aware that even just given this kind of the the the, the firewalls that were that were developed that you know it looks like 10% and this so far, and I mean, you know, following up perhaps on some uh, what uh, Brady, the, the person who lived in one of these, perhaps looked like it may be even just slightly higher, but 10% of people who really shouldn't have been allowed to purchase in these buildings did buy. So that gives you at least a measure of the kind of protocols you're going to have to ensure for future projects. Let's take another call. <clears throat> um, uh, Michael is joining us from Tawasin. I understand you live in Point Roberts, though, Michael. Yes, I actually do, um, but I'm I'm in Tawasin just doing some shopping right now and have to call in because um, what I thought I was, it was the other way usually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Where's the cheap cheese? The is good for Americans right now, but unfortunately we have the same problems, uh, maybe even worse in the states because we don't have any laws or restrictions on you know how people use their properties, how many they can own. We don't have a registry, you know, or. Um, but it's it should be incredibly simple. Where I live, 90 to 95 percent of the homes are kept empty all year round um, or most of the year. Talk to anyone who lives in the neighborhood. Send inspectors by. If you can't verify that it's an actual residence, a primary year round residence, like even a once a month inspection, like if they had just a few employees, city employees, provincial employees. How much whoever, would that cost, do you think? I a lot less than the billions and billions of dollars that going down the toilet deliberately keeping real estate empty to benefit spe speculators, money launderers, tax evaders. We all know what's going on. Look at how many properties. We're talking about people who own six properties already who are doing this. It, it's a, it would pay for itself. Like This is how you enforce the Airbnb rules. This is how you enforce any of it. Hmm. Send inspectors by. Go through it. You would get dozens of violators in an hour of work of simply. I could do it tomorrow. I could walk down any street, any neighborhood, in in Washington State or in BC, and have a dozen, you know, violators who clearly nobody lives in the place. Couldn't be easier. Michael, Talk to anybody who actually lives and works in the neighborhood. Thanks so much for the call. Enjoy your day in Tawasin. Um, th that's an interesting point. You know, how far do you go to, um, uh, to ensure, um, accountability? I wonder too, you know, how, regardless of how far you go, will there always be someone who will try to game the system? And is the problem here really 
you know, the the looking at property as as investments. Right, right. And I think that that is really at the heart of it, the bigger challenge in terms of housing in British Columbia. I mean, you go into these basic numbers, I, again, 38 uh, percent of all condos in the city of Victoria are investor owned. That, that again, when we look about recently built, uh, newly built condominiums, you're talking about 64 percent of condos are investor owned. And I mean, in certain ways, and in, in, in they, they are put on the rental market, but then they, of course, tend to be a bit more expensive, but then also unstable. But then I think that it's an understanding that there is a role for investment, but then how it begins to take over the entire housing system, just as people, some people are doing it as an investment, but others are struggling to find it as a human need. Mm. That I think is the is the problem here in British Columbia, that we found that really in the, in the problems of British Columbia, you have this competition between those who are in desperate need of housing versus those who are finding, trying to find their next investment. Mm. It's finding that, that balance. Exactly. Uh, Andy, it is always so good to speak with you. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Michelle. Andy Yan, Director of the City Program at Simon Fraser University. 12.31 now, 1.31 in the Mountain Time Zone. This is BC Today here on CBC. I'm Michelle Elliott. Thanks so much for being with us. And coming up in our next half hour, CBC's Justin McElroy will be here. We'll also be joined by Shauna Sylvester, a former Vancouver mayoral candidate, as we discuss the challenges in front of municipal politicians right now. Right now, it's time for a CBC News update, and here's Robert Zimmerman. Good afternoon. The Helsinki Nation says its relationship with the Vancouver Police Board has broken down. The two groups had agreed to work together to address systemic racism in policing after an Indigenous man and his granddaughter were handcuffed after trying to open a bank account five years ago. BC's Human Rights Commissioner says there are significant shortcomings in the follow-through on that agreement. Vancouver's mayor says he's extremely disappointed. A magic mushroom dispensary is back in business. Council yesterday overturned the dispensary suspension and allowed it to receive a new business license. Mayor Ken Sim says the action was activism on a matter beyond the jurisdiction of the city. And Penticton Council says it will send a letter to the BC and federal governments asking for more action to combat the spread of invasive mussels in the area. The council says it supports the Okanagan Basin Water Board's push to suspend out of province boats from entering BC lakes and rivers until a full assessment of the mussels is completed. And now the forecast on the north coast. Rain mixed with snow this afternoon. Strong winds and a high of three. Highs to minus eight with sunshine in the peace. In the central interior, a mix of sun and cloud this afternoon with a high of minus six. Highs from minus one to plus three and mainly sunny in the Kootenays. In the southern interior, mainly sunny with a high of two. And for Metro Vancouver, Greater Victoria and the Fraser Valley, cloudy this afternoon. There's a slight chance of showers or flurries with highs around five. That's your CBC News update from Vancouver. I did start watching Oppenheimer last night. And? And so far... It does take a couple nights it's pretty long. <laughs> yes. I'll finish probably after the Oscars are over, um, but very compelling so far. It is, I yes. can report. And uh, yes, it is also nominated for Best Picture. I'm saying this because we talked about it yesterday uh, on the show and Barbie as well. Anatomy of a Fall, Past Lives... Poor Things, Maestro, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Zone of Interest, American Fiction, and The Holdovers. So if you have a pool going, those are your choices. Hmm. My money's on Oppenheimer. Yeah, you know, it was Seems pre like the, pretty the dark. favorite. Seems to be the favorite mm. uh, going on. But all the stands, like for Barbie, will be very upset, as you know. Um, I, I did enjoy it as well. Just to put it Yeah, no, I enjoyed so. Barbie as well. Yeah, so, yeah. but I know, the odds are. So I, I guess you and I can have our own pool. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we both agree, so I don't know <laughs> what that does. Two-person pool, I yeah, don't know. Yeah, a two-person uh, pool. You yeah. can buy me buy me lunch. I'll buy you lunch. Sure. In the end, we all win. But we both want Oppenheimer, we said. Didn't yeah, we? exactly. We yeah. both win. It's a win-win situation. How can you <laughs> reject that? Sure. Yeah. I'm all over it. All over it. I'm As in. As always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rob, thank you. Sure. Rob Zimmerman. <laughs> in the CBC Vancouver newsroom. That in itself should be nominated for something. I don't know what. Uh, this is BC Today on CBC Radio 1. I'm Michelle Elliott. Thanks so much for being with us. We're also live streaming on cbc.ca slash bc, on the CBC News app, and on YouTube at CBC Vancouver. You can watch us uh, on demand after the program as well.
Well, from climate disasters at their doorstep, housing pressures, and uh, homelessness and substance use health crises, municipal politicians seem to be grappling with a lot these days. And for so many smaller towns, local mayors and councillors, well, they're not big-time politicians. They're your neighbour, your kid's teacher, uh, the local store clerk. And take the small Vancouver Island village of Sayward, with about 350 pe people living there. Now, those local politicians have been dealing with some chaotic public meetings. CBC's Justin McElroy has that story for us today. Many similar politicians, of, uh, stories rather, of politicians dealing with anger at their council chambers as well. Uh, here on the Lower Main now, you, you'll recall last month, the larger community of Richmond, they had to deal with some heated meetings uh, over a proposal to explore the possibility of a safe consumption site. He's Rich Richmond Mayor Malcolm Brody intervening at a public hearing last month. You will respect the process. This is not some kind of a theater or a carnival. This is a very solemn occasion where we are making important discussions and decisions for the city. And I can tell you that I've been doing this since the mid 90s and that is the first time I've had that kind of a reaction here in the city council. That's Richmond Mayor Malcolm Brody. Well, we're asking you, what is the state of local politics in your community? If you are a municipal politician in BC, we would love to hear from you. Let us know how has your job changed and what do local politicians need to be able to deal with those big issues that affect their communities? You can call us 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. And uh, by email, you can reach us at bctoday at cbc.ca. If you'd like to text us, it's 236-330-2623. Joining me now is CBC's Municipal Affairs reporter, Justin McElroy. We're also joined by Shauna Sylvester. She was an independent Vancouver mayoral candidate in 2018. She's now the founder and lead of the Urban Climate Leadership Hello, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Hi, Michelle. Nice to have you. It's been a while since I've seen you, Shauna. Welcome. It is. And I can't say how much um, I love the fact that I'm sitting just next to Justin with his shirt on. This is fabulous. Absolutely. The CBC shirt, trademark. The, the exploding pizza, as the they call it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk later about how you're going off on a trip. Mm -hmm. We're going to miss seeing that T-shirt yeah, around yeah, here yeah. for a little while. Uh, you made another trip, a smaller trip recently, mm -hmm. to the northeast side of Vancouver Island to the village of Sayward. Why did you want to go there? Yeah, a couple of reasons. So, to, you know, in my role as municipal affairs reporter in BC, I often get people saying, hey, you should report her on our town or come to our community. There's this real dysfunction happening or there's this real scandal. Uh, and I had a few people reach out to me in Sayward over the last couple of months. Now, Sayward is a place that has had massive turnover in its mayor and senior staff over the last five years. There's been five separate mayors. There's been six separate chief administrative officers, right. more than anywhere else in BC. They only have about 350 people. Their finances are the possibly worst in BC. They have the lowest financial reserves of uh, anywhere. Uh, and so some people in town are debating whether they should continue being a community, a municipality, to, to be precise, whether they should disincorporate and be take off, taken over by the regional district instead uh and i went to one of their council meetings you know for the first 20 30 minutes it was question time it was uh, filled with a bunch of residents uh, yelling at councillors councillors yelling back at residents wow. one of them swearing people alleging corruption or editing of council tapes and all sorts of things that have very little to do with policy and ways that communities try to pass legislation to make things better for themselves and more about interpersonal conflicts mm -hmm. and gossip and allegation and all the things that can easily take over discussion mm -hmm. in a town big or small that isn't based necessarily on the facts on the ground but paralyze what a community can or can't do. And, and we don't need to get into those specifics of those interpersonal conflicts and all of that and accusations, but 
what does that signify to how how people are feeling about their community in Sayward? Well, well, I think it's something that we see in a lot of places. Mm. And, you know, when I started doing this job at CBC seven years ago, uh, we didn't talk a lot about small town dysfunction mm -hmm. in the same way. And yet in the last year and a half, we've talked about Harrison Hot Springs. Yes. We've talked about Lions Bay, Tassis, even a larger community like Kamloops mm -hmm. has lawsuits and uh, provincial advisors coming right. in as well because it's this increasing inability it seems like for people to disagree in an agreeable way in a way that they can have their arguments over issues but yet still be able to go forward with the business of governing and creating a political environment in town where people can trust that their politicians even if they agree or disagree with them are doing ultimately or trying to do the best for them but we're seeing in so many different places where it just becomes a giant cesspool of allegations and negative on social media, the politicians then uh, get, get stressed out and anxious about that because they don't have the supports around them. And it just creates this loop, which really isn't helpful in so many of these municipalities. Shauna, what are the stressors for local politicians right now? There are many, and I think those are more symptoms to a broader issue. Mm. I think that we're really suffering a democratic deficit where people don't feel that the system is meeting their needs. And that can become, because of the way in which we govern, the electoral system hasn't met the needs, the way in which we maintain public hearings, which is very oppositional. So there's a number of things where our system isn't meeting our needs, and so folks are, are stepping away. But there are so many other things that are going on. Cities have to contend, as you said, at the front end with so many issues that they didn't have to contend yeah. with before and they don't have the authority or the finances to do that. So they're not, they're having to constantly navigate provincial and federal terms. They're also dealing with climate and catastrophic natural disasters that are impacting their basic abilities to provide for the safety and, uh, and continuity of life for their citizens. We've got, we've got companies now that won't provide mortgages in to cities mm -hmm. that are viable. And then you've got information technology moving at such a speed that's setting up expectations for delivery. And so again, dashed hopes because you're not getting the services that you expect. And so for the role of a civic politician, how has it changed then? And do they, as you said, they're, they're working within this system where they're at the behest of upper levels of government. You know, what, what needs to change there? It used to be that you'd go to government because they had all the answers. And we still operate that way. But the reality is the municipal government is just one in many players that can solve a problem. And so we need government officials to see their, not to go and set demands and tell the people how it's going to be, but to actually get in and consult. And I look at Mayor Hurley as a very good example of that in Burnaby, where he had one of the most difficult housing situations. And what he chose to do was to go out and actually work with citizens and all the developers and all of the tenants' rights groups and say, let's solve this together. And he has now gone out and has done a citizen assembly with his help from S Simon Fraser University Center for Dialogue to actually look at the long-term community plan. It's a very different way of governing. And I think as a result, he wasn't challenged in the last election. He's not seeing the same kind of problems that you see in other jurisdictions. Justin, five mayors, six uh, chief administrative officers in Sayward. I mean, are you seeing more of that turnover? Uh, not quite as much from mayors. Most of them try and stick it out, either because of of pride, ego. Um, they they think they're in the right uh, as well. Chief administrative officers, though, that is a big issue. These are the people that are managing your staff and, and the day to day running of the actual government. And we're seeing an increase in the number of people that only last six, twelve, eighteen months in those positions for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and to Shauna's point, uh, yeah, it's you know, creating a good political culture just doesn't happen in a community, mm. um, especially in this day and age where there's so many pressures on a local government. Your tools are limited. Social media amplifies people's disagreements. You have to actively work to cultivate that place where people feel at least heard or understood, even if they don't necessarily agree with all of Mayor Hurley's policies in Burnaby, for example. There's 250,000 people in the city, and none of them said, you know, I feel compelled to run for mayor against him because they felt things were going uh, okay. Uh, so you have to put that work in. And 
the way you do that in a place of 250,000 people is different than a city of 350. Mm. And there's challenges for both the big and the small, but it's things people have to be aware of and work at before you get to that point. Because once things become toxic, it's very hard to reverse that trend in a short period of time. I want to ask you, you just mentioned social media. I want to ask you how that's changed things over these seven years um, of uh, your reporting. But just for, for municipal politicians, what what is the incentive, then, I guess, to, 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 to run and to do your public duty, right? Uh, but we want to ask our listeners as well, uh, what is the state of local politics in your community? What is that political culture? We would love to hear from you if you are a municipal politician how has your own job changed and what do local politicians need to deal with uh, in, in order to to deal with those uh, those issues in their community? What are the resources that you need? Any changes that you'd like to see? Uh, 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733, pound 690 on your cell phone by email, bctoday at cbc.ca. Oh, you mentioned the community of Kamloops. Tim is joining us from there. Hi, Tim. Hi. Um, yeah, as I was saying to your screener, I, I don't know if it's really surprising, but at the same time, I think it varies on the community. It, as, in a place such as Sayward, which is such a smaller area, uh, whether or not they're having any growth or anybody wants to move there, and that's why their resources are low, i.e. in people or polit political capital. But in a place like Kamloops, which I understand, I keep hearing is supposedly the third fastest growing region in the country. Mm. I don't know if that's a bucket of something or not. But the thing is, is that a lot of downloading, as your guests have said, and they would know a lot better than I, from both the federal and political levels, uh, and therefore, a lot of the issues that I believe are in the lower mainland, which is west of Hope, are now entering east of Hope, especially within the southern part of British Columbia. Yeah, we're not talking Paris or Tokyo growth. We're talking the growth of southern British Columbia, and resources are stretched thin. Mm. Because you're, all these people, whether they're moving from other parts of this country or you have immigration, you are going to have levels of demands that are going to only increase. And again, it depends on the thing, because in Sayward, I'm not sure exactly what the rationale is for their their disagreements. I'll hang up and listen. Thanks. Yeah, really appreciate your call, Tim. Nice to hear from you in Kamloops. Yeah, you, you, your thoughts on downloading of issues uh, to communities, um, communities uh, issues uh, that affect lower mainland communities moving for further now of course we're dealing with housing and there's a lot of pressure on on those politicians to meet uh, housing demand and housing uh, targets from the provincial government um, so how, how do you see that playing out in a city like Kamloops? Tim thanks for that because the city of Kamloops is going through a lot there are things that that the city has to contend with like housing like mental health like the opioid poisoning crisis which is going on there as well um, even transportation issues that the city of Kamloops is trying to deal with. And they're also having to deal with growth without having the ability to finance all the infrastructure that can lead to that growth. And it's been exciting to see the Federation of Canadian Municipalities actually step up for the cities like Kamloops and say, we need a different, different municipal development growth framework. We need something that provides some kind of taxation authority for municipalities or some kind of um, funds that they can predict they will have to address the growing issues. And when you look at Kamloops with wildfires and flooding in the areas around, uh, those are a whole new level of threats to infrastructure uh, that they have to contend with, and they need the resources to do that. Do you want to jump on that? Lack of resources. Yeah, and uh, part of the frustration from locals comes from the fact that, you know, we always talk about that municipal government is on the front door. It's the first step for people. It's the people that you know in your community and the people that you're going to go through. And when uh, you see things changing or you see issues come up and uh, you ask what can my local council do and you and they say well our budgets are stretched because of all these uh, different issues that we're taking on we have limited area for taxation but we're working on applying to the provincial government for mm. a grant that might come in two or three years to create a regional strategy you're to move your head, forward Shana, yeah. uh, uh, the, or or you're <laughs> sitting in you're the town of Lytton or you're the town mm -hmm. of Chilliwack or you're the town that has had to Merit. deal with wildfires mm -hmm. and flooding and who do you go to who do you go to? Everyone's coming to your door and your staff are overworked and they're just at their wits end. And so who do you go to? And this is 
this is a really big issue for our province. We have to stop treating municipalities as creations of the province and recognize them as on the front line, as Jason has said, to the most critical issues of our time and get that. Sorry about that, Justin. Go ahead. Yeah, no, but, but uh, you know, we can say that, but that's how the Constitution sets it up. And this is a thing that the Federation of Communities of Canadian Municipalities always talks about as well, the, that this was a system of division of powers and abilities to do things set up 155 years ago when a fraction of the people that live in cities today lived in them in Canada. And yet we still have that paradigm in place. And mm. it just causes so many delays in getting things things done and so many difficulties for, you know, it's tough even if you're a Vancouver or Surrey to navigate this, let alone all these municipalities that have just a tiny amount of that revenue and people. Yeah. And who's, uh, don't, uh, who have other day jobs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's not their main job. We want to hear from our audience too, you know, what is the state of local politics in your community? If you are a municipal politician, we do hear from them on this program, uh, we'd love to hear from you. You know, what's your job like and how has your job job changed. And we've been hearing about resources. What do local politicians need to be able to deal with those big issues, climate change, housing, homelessness, uh, the uh, overdose crisis, the opioid uh, crisis? These affect communities at their doorstep. So what are the resources they need? 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733, pound 690 on your cell phone. And uh, we have an email here from Scott who writes, how about implementing a yearly sortition election for one of the council positions? So this would be selecting public officials uh, or jurors use, using a random representative sample. Uh, and so this uh, is said to minimize factionalism. And Scott writes, this would happen on top of a conventional election for the majority of council spots. This would run a city more like a jury and become less divisive. Okay, Scott, thanks so much for weighing in. Our next caller is Jude in Vancouver. Hi, Jude. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for calling in. What are your thoughts on, on how local politicians are, are uh, dealing with the added pressures they have now? Well, um, in, in terms of uh, listening to uh, some of the uh, comments made earlier, I definitely agree that there are a lot of uh, uh, pressures that we're seeing throughout the country coming down uh, uh, for um, local politicians to deal with, uh, as we're seeing it uh, manifest with our housing crisis, with some of the challenges around resiliency in communities and mm. climate effects. Uh, especially, I'm wondering uh, specifically on on the climate part. As we're seeing communities having to deal with emergency scenarios and adapt, and and also work through our own emissions. What are some of the ways uh, that, that that we can expect uh, a direct federal local relationship on this to uh, support local communities as well? Federal local relationship. So it's you know the the government that directs policies and how that can affect or directly relate, more direct, directly relate with the communities that are affected. Some yeah, and, and, and support them. Maybe it follows support. funding through additional support with legislation or mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm open to the ideas there. Yeah, absolutely. Great question, Jude. Um, Shauna. Absolutely. This is this is what I spend my days doing is related to climate and cities and trying to remove obstacles for cities to do this work. Um, and I think that there's a number of things. Cities are on the front line of actually reducing our GHG emissions. They are the first that are really leading the country in, in climate action, but not actually recognized as such. So there is efforts to really ensure that the provincial and federal government recognize and resource that work. I think that there's more that this uh, that provinces can do. It's really looking at the policies. What are the enabling policies that would allow cities to look at the infrastructure needs that they have, so that they're not they're not rebuilding in Lytton or Lillooet in a way that is the way they used to, but is resilient. That's actually embedding some of the things that we've learned about. Yesterday, I think it was. Uh, former mayor of Edmonton, Don Iveson's report on housing and the task force on housing and climate came out. Great recommendations on that one to actually really reinforce how we are building and thinking about the future. And that's going to need, uh, that's going to need provincial, federal, but real recognition of the leadership that cities play. How does, how have you seen this in your reporting over seven years? 
Yeah, it, and it, like I said, it, it, it's changed and it's evolved and the urgency that people feel for all sorts of different reasons, particularly on the climate impact. If, you've, if you're in a small community where you've had two or three evacuation orders mm -hmm. every, to, to every summer uh, or you've seen Lytton burn down, uh, to, when it comes to, to questions of uh, political culture and dysfunction, uh, we see more places that have an inability for people to come together in a way that they, they used to. You know, the, these are serious questions on the front lines, and I think it's important for higher level levels of government to look at which ways they can put in supports to help communities, but also, to, you know, we always say turnout in local government 20, 30 percent at election time. Um, it's important for people to be engaged, to be, be talking about it outside of election time to ensure that they have healthy communities. Let's squeeze in a quick call here because we have a call from Anne Livingston uh, with the mm -hmm. Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. Hi, Hi Anne. Hi. Yeah, thanks for calling in. What are your thoughts on, on how municipalities are dealing? Are they able to deal with uh, the opioid crisis right now? Well, the mistake they make is they keep hiring more and more bylaw officers and police when they should be hiring advocates who then put the pressure on the province to ensure the health of the people that are, you know, living all over their streets with, with drug problems. And then the worse than that, they we've had so many municipalities, three being one I can think of offhand, um, who, and Nanaimo as well, have blocked and harassed people who are doing overdose prevention sites to the point that they can't open at all. And they've had, um, you know, funded provincial sites and unable to find a spot that are just abandoned, certainly so, in Newton and Surrey, that's true. What would enable them to make those decisions that you're, you're calling for? Well, for, rich, for one thing, they should recognize they don't have that decision-making power. It's a health facility, and they should protect landlords from a civil forfeiture threat that the RCMP are doing. And they need to make a bubble and say, we're going to stop fighting this. We're going to handle this. And then they need to hire people to at the city level who work for the city, who ensure that every single person who's entitled to housing and um, entitled to welfare gets the maximum amount. And then they can upload the expenses that they're currently paying for hundreds of bylaw offers who, who do nothing but really create more and more misery and death. Okay. And thank you very much. Uh, thanks for weighing in on this. Uh, that's Anne Livingston with Van Du. I have about a minute left. Uh, Justin McElroy, uh, you are taking a very, very well-deserved break from your job <laughs> reporting. Tell us where you're going. It's very exciting. Yeah, I'll be taking some time to, uh, off from going to public hearings uh, <laughs> and talking about amendments to amendments uh, and doing a sabbatical for a year, traveling the world, 52 countries in 52 weeks. There are too many spreadsheets and rankings uh, and plans <laughs> in place, but I'm so excited. You know, I've lived in BC my entire life, and it's been so fascinating to get to travel this province and to explore stories here and to get to go everywhere else and get a sense uh, of different places in the world that I've only seen uh, uh, in pictures is going to be so uh, amazing and I'm so grateful for the opportunity. I don't want to pressure you to post because you should take the break, but I look forward to any of the charts that come after. Have a great time. Thanks, Michelle. We will miss you. I'll miss you, everyone too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We wish you well, though. Justin.